read it to you briefly uh, to put it in your mind. Uh, new eyes each year find old books here, and new books too, old eyes renew. So youth and age, like ink and page, in this house join, minting new coin. Lark Philip Larkin, who is probably the most admired English poet in the latter half of the 20th century, was a librarian himself. He was university librarian at Hull in England. And I think this poem is especially appropriate for this occasion because it gives us a sense of the library as a place, uh, particularly as a place that spans generations. Uh, new eyes each year find old books here, and old, new books too, old eyes renew. That it's a place where the sense of the past is transmitted to younger readers. It's often the first place they get it, in fact, is from being in the stacks and suddenly seeing all those books. I remember the first time I got in the stacks of the Bryn Mawr College Library when I was 12 years old. I was just sort of overwhelmed by the physical presence of all those books. And they also keep older generation in touch with new ideas. Uh, new books, too, old eyes renew. There's a nice little pun on renew there, right? That books renew readers, but readers also renew books, that they keep old eyes in circulation with new ideas. And that commitment to spanning the generation, you can see in the design of the space with the children's area, the young adult lounge area, and the seniors uh, corner. Hello. I'm Katherine Byers White, your host of the Los Altos History Show. You've just seen an excerpt taken from the recent dedication of the newly remodeled Los Altos Library. The keynote speaker was Dr. David Rigg. He was reading a poem by Philip Larkin. In the spirit of celebrating our library and Los Altos history, we have a very special guest this evening, Carol Teft, the city librarian. Carol received a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Kansas and a Master of Library Science from the University of Illinois. She began her professional work as a cataloger at the University of Kansas. She also told me that the day some involuntary tears ran down her cheeks and froze as she braved the cold Kansas wind, she thought there must be a warmer climate somewhere to use this degree. So she and her husband, a graphics designer, trekked west, as so many of us have done, to find a new and warmer life. Carol and her husband have raised two sons here in Los Altos. One is a Navy pilot, and the other is a student at Foothill College. Carol loves books, gardening, and travel. Carol has been managing librarian in Los Altos for 30 years. She has seen tremendous changes in the way libraries operate and in the way libraries are used. Just a few weeks ago, she was on hand for the dedication of the newly remodeled library, but Carol was also on hand for the first dedication of a library at Civic Center site some 30 years ago. Welcome, Carol. Thank you very much. Good to have you here. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the library. I understand from my readings that the library actually existed around the turn of the century and has seen many, many incarnations in different forms. And I also understand that the Los Altos Library was the first library in Santa Clara County. Is that yes. correct? We were the first branch of the Santa Clara County Library in 1914, I think. and. Um, there was a land office selling real estate in, in uh, Los Altos, and C.E. Miner, who ran that land office, offered the county that he would run a library for them for $5 a month <laughs> and keep it open all day long. 
and this was a deal the county couldn't refuse, and so they <laughs> opened their first branch of the county library in Los Altos. Well, I could see why they couldn't refuse yes. at a price <laughs> like that. That's, That's right. amazing. And then I understand, too, uh, many changes during when we went into the Depression and how... That's what? right. The, the library moved from the land office to eventually to the Scout Hall, which was sort of like a community center. A lot of different groups used it. Mm -hmm. But soon the library just wasn't able to be open enough, so they started looking for a library building that they could have and um, for themselves. And the county was unable to finance it nothing changes <laughs> and um, so they asked the city to do that and the citizens um, got together and through Guy Schaup they talked Southern Pacific into letting them lease the powerhouse which is um, now gone but it was where Safeway is currently yes and um, on First Street and so they leased it to the library for one dollar a year and the citizens came in and painted it and the depression had come at this time and um, this was in the early 30s and more and more people were wanting to use the library because uh, they couldn't buy books themselves they hadn't the money many of them didn't have jobs and they were looking for things to do so during the depression libraries experienced a real increase in readers and uh, users of the library it's very interesting. We were talking about that beforehand, and, and even now during our current mm -hmm. kind of economic right. chaos, you That's were saying. Correct. Yeah, libraries experience an increase in use in depressions and in recessions. Part of it is the economic situation that people um, cannot buy as many books as they want to read. Right. But even more, they're looking for material to help them find a job or to improve their ability on the job, increase their skills, and so on and libraries um, have that material for them so libraries find they get more usage at a time when they're getting less money oftentimes through the revenues but uh, yeah this is true throughout the country very interesting let's go to 19 was it 1956 when some real changes started happening with the library yeah that's correct yeah. what really was happening was the county was changing and we were going from an ur uh, from a rural county to an urban county and um, Los Altos, which used to be 500 citizens, suddenly, you know, was 15,000 citizens, and Los Altos incorporated. Um, but also, their library was not coming along as fast as their city was. And um, by then, the uh, <laughs> Southern Pacific had decided a dollar a year wasn't cutting it. <laughs> so they wanted to increase the rent. And the citizens went to the county again and said, you know, maybe there's a way where we could build a building. And um, so the city appointed a committee. The Girl Scouts actually asked them to appoint a committee. The Girl Scouts got very involved in how the library didn't really meet the needs of the citizens. It was a very interesting time. And so a citizens committee was appointed and they looked at different ways to finance the library and came up with the concept of a bond issue that the city would pass and then the county would pay the city back uh, the exact amount that those bonds uh, incurred as rent and that worked and that was a good solution yeah, that them. was a good solution the library was on State Street by this time because they decided that uh, not to pay Southern Pacific the, the money that they wanted so they found another place to rent on State Street and um, that was where I first arrived was when we were on State Street at that time all of the county libraries were in storefronts and I came from the Midwest where there were always Carnegie libraries and in the East and the Midwest the uh, Andrew Carnegie Fund had funded libraries throughout the country so that every city no matter how small had a library and they all were similar architecture and everybody was used to that and then we came out to the West as you say many of us trekked out here and we found the libraries were in storefronts and we were very surprised and it was a whole different um, way of running a library but it was partly because the county was changing so fast the library couldn't keep up with it and we didn't have Mr. Carnegie to build us libraries at that time. Well I also know too from what you were sharing with me a little bit of reading I did that the citizens have been such advocates for the library throughout Los Altos history. That's right, that's right. And I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about the friends of the library right. and their role they have been extremely active over the years. In fact, the first Citizens Committee recommended 
that a friends group be developed and AAUW developed a friends group and they began right from the beginning supporting the library through book sales, um, through just letting the community know the library was there and letting the library know what the community's needs were so they were very interactive from the beginning and over the years they've become very professional with their book sales and they're so good at it <laughs> that they are now earning somewhere in the neighborhood of between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year for the library oh that's superb yes and also they have been very influential in helping to develop the bond issues that have been passed. The first one that built the original building 30 years ago um, was the first bond issue to pass in Los Altos, period. And then another bond issue was passed to build Woodland. All these issues the citizens got behind and the friends led that effort and the library commission also. And then in 1985 they passed a tax override, unheard of in this county, but they did it. And um, then in 1990, they passed a continuance of that tax override, which included additional bond money to build um, 14,000 square feet and remodel the existing library. So it, in effect, doubled the library. It's good to have that support, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. It's wonderful to work in a community like this that, where people really value the library and they value reading and, and information. Well, Los Altos has such a rich history, and I, I want to jump back a little bit in time. Um, Mrs. Landells, mm -hmm, could you yes. tell me a little bit about <laughs> her and what she well, gave? Well, she was one of, the, one of the first custodians after Mr. Minor. Um, Mrs. Landells was uh, Reverend Landells' wife, and Reverend Landells was quite a character, evidently, and he not only was the, the local reverend, but he also was called uh, Mr. Chamber of Commerce and he headed up the men's club and uh, he was very much the pusher of all things for Los Altos. And um, he and Mrs. Landells kind of together sort of ran the library. First Mrs. Uh, Landells was, um, I guess for about 20 years, um, she saw to it that she really got involved and saw to it that books got actually purchased for the library and she was very instrumental in bringing the first children's books in. Um, and she saw to it that the library got um, better hours. She worked with the county library and she was paid now ten dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and she worked usually, uh, she had kept the library open in the beginning like two days a month or two afternoons a month. And then later she worked to bring it up to three afternoons. And as time went along, um, there was just more and more interest and more usage and the library began to be open all day. <laughs> so it got more and more. And then finally, of course, we did go to, by the time we were on State Street, we were open 64 hours a week. Could you tell me a little bit about the recent remodeling? What, well, what prompted it and? Well, space and the change in technology. Libraries had totally changed in the 30 years since we built the building uh, in the Civic Center. And nobody could have predicted then that we would have computers and that's the way we would look our books up. And in fact, uh, we would have videos and CDs and talking books and everything had so totally changed that um, the, the library just wasn't adequate any longer. It was built to house 70,000 volumes and we had crammed into it 140,000 volumes. Oh, that's so, amazing. So we had lost um, seating space, of course, and, um, and we, our shelves were clear up to s the seven foot height, and it, it, it was a crowded library. And then the technology was a real problem because we, we just didn't have adequate technology. So that was what prompted a space needs study, and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> so. Well, um, we were talking earlier about, we just read recently in the paper that newspapers actually are going online to computers. It's yeah. amazing yes. how many new technologies. Oh, could absolutely. You, could you talk a little bit about how library technology has changed, how computers have affected right. the library? And well, um, we have integrated catalogs now so that from the time a book is ordered, it, it shows up in a computer that you can sit in your local library or you can sit in your home with a PC and a modem and access the library computer. And you can find out the minute a book is ordered, 
You can see when it, it arrives and goes into processing. You can see whether it's checked in or out. You can see uh, if it's on reserve. Um, you can look it up in all the ways that you could with a card catalog, plus many more ways. You can look it up if you don't even remember the author or the title exactly. You can look it up with keywords. And the whole thing has totally changed. And indexes for magazines are now on computer. A lot of encyclopedias are on computer. There are books now being published in CD-ROM form, which is a form of computer access. There are books being published only in CD-ROM form. They're just not available as hard copy anymore. So mm -hmm. more and more things are being com produced in computer forms because we learn in many different ways, so, and we access now in many different ways. Well, I can imagine the youngsters must really enjoy the, the computers. How is everybody adapting to all these <laughs> rapid changes? Well, um, the librarians <laughs> uh, were probably the first to be shocked, but the librarians are adapting and uh, learning new skills. But in addition to that, the public is really accepting it very well for the most part. I think we're, we all have a certain um, worry and fear that we're not catching all the information we need, but then we never got it all out of the ca uh, card catalog either. And we have docents in the library. These are volunteers. We have 60 volunteers who come in, each of them two hours a week, and they're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're retired people, they're young people, they're all ages. Some of them never touched a computer in their life, and they came in to be trained by us, and now they help their the public, as the public comes in, they offer to help them. And that's really exciting. And some of them are so enthusiastic that if somebody is a little bit reluctant, they really jump in and, and turn them on <laughs> so that the person goes away believing that computer catalogs are the best way to access books and magazines and everything else. Yeah, it can be a little intimidating at first. I know. I think it can, yes. It's, you know, it's just like the programming your VCR. It isn't as hard as that. So, <laughs> Well, we had an opportunity recently to come down to the library and take a tour. And in a while, we'll be rolling some of that tape. But before we do that, we went all around the library. As I said, it, I was found it quite beautiful. Um, and we also looked at the technology, the fax machines, the new cataloging systems, and you showed us how easy it is mm -hmm. to, to use those. Um, what do you see as the wave of the future? Oh. <laughs> well, will we not be having hardbound books I anymore? Yeah, I, I think there will, all, there will be indexes and books and reference material that you can only access that way. That's already happening. Um, I think what we will see is more and more access of greater catalogs. Right now we have entry into internet, and from internet you can look at the catalog at the London School of Economics and find out if the book's in or out, <laughs> what you would care about that <laughs> at this, from this distance, but you at least can find books that you would never have been able to find any other way. So I, you know, you hear about Clinton is talks about the super highways of, of computers now to access information. And the libraries are the local point at which you will access a lot of this information. And the, it is a highway. It's already there. And it's just a matter of plugging it all together better than it has been. And it's, it's an exciting time, very exciting. It is exciting, isn't it? Yes. Um, I wanted to, to change topics for a minute and talk a little bit about the Library Commission and their role. All right. In, in helping the, bring this new library? The Library Commission um, began essentially uh, by doing a, st a space needs study with the library and becoming convinced themselves that we needed something further. We needed to do something else to expand the space. And they also looked into all the possible ways of financing. And first of all, of course, we approached the county. And the county said, well, they really could not. They had financed the first one by paying the rent um, over the last 20 years and had paid off the building, but they really could not do that again because of financial situations. And um, so the commission then began to look at other ways of financing, and it was through their efforts that uh, it was settled that we 
would try a financing through a joint powers agreement between the city of Los Altos and the city of Los Altos, or the town of Los Altos Hills. <clears throat> and that was arranged. It's called the North County Library Authority. And they put the measure on the ballot, and the Library Commission um, began a grassroots group that got together and said, yeah, we want to back this. And um, they went out and made speeches, and they um, walked precincts, and they got other people enthused, and they put up yard signs. And um, the next thing we knew, we were right in the middle of a campaign. And so Measure F was what it was in 1990. And it passed by 75%, which shows you how big support. Yeah, how big the support is here in town. It's good to hear yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Carol, I know we're nearing the end of the mm -hmm. show, and I, I do want to talk about your history at the library. <laughs> um, you've been there 30 years, yeah. and you were there at the opening of the yes. first yes, official library. Yes, yes, Can I you was. talk a little bit about that and and these 30 years yeah. and what it was like to be there then and now? Mm -hmm. Well, it has changed so totally. My job is not at all the same <laughs> as what it used to be. <clears throat> yeah, it, I, was, I was there at the ribbon cutting 30 years ago, and it was a lot of fun. And we just thought we had the most wonderful library in the whole world, and we didn't think we'd ever outgrow it. And of course, then we were talking about books. We weren't talking about computers and fax machines, as you say, and Xerox and public computers and, and all the other things that we have there for people. So it seemed wonderful. And for years, it really was. Um, I watched the things change from books to, I remember the first phono records we ordered. And now, <laughs> phono records are a thing of the past. You can't buy them, and we couldn't keep ours, our collection going because it just got so old that we had to discard the ones that we had left. And, um, but I remember when we first bought phono records, and we thought we were really doing something unusual. And we were. We were the first county library to have phono records. And then the next thing was tapes, and then there were CDs, and yeah, it just changes constantly. And um, the needs and the, and the skills that it takes to access all this just keeps changing. But the public doesn't change. They're still in there wanting to get information. And uh, that's what's been exciting and kept it very interesting is how the public is so excited and turned on by libraries. Yeah, they, it, thank God they're the one constant. Yes. It sounds like in all of this. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. You, boy, you've seen a lot of changes, and yeah. it's been very interesting having you here, Carol. Thank you. And we want to go to our tape here in a moment. Um, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Um, we've joined Carol and her staff this past weekend to get a firsthand look at what a 1990s library looks like and how it operates. I hope you enjoyed this evening's show and that you enjoyed this video tour of the Los Altos Library. Until next time, goodbye. Let's roll that tape. We met Carol at the recently expanded and renovated Los Altos Library. We asked her to give us an overview of the different areas of the library. As you come into the library, you first enter into a very spacious lobby that has the circulation desk. And then as you come on in further, you will see a, an art wall, which um, has been set aside for us to have art exhibits. And we change the exhibits every two months. We just put up a new exhibit, which is wonderful. And then on, uh, also we have the children's room. And then the adult room has uh, a large reference area, and then area, special areas for magazines and uh, newspapers, audiovisual areas for such things as talking books and CDs and CD-ROMs, and of course lounge areas for people to sit and read, and many tables for them to study at tables. And then, of course, many, many stacks for them, uh, shelves for the books themselves. And then in the children's side, we have a a program room which is available for the public on the weekend. So many community organizations have meetings there on the weekend in the library. It has programs, both children's and adult programs, for the public um, that, we that we have in the program room. Another special area that we've been able to develop in the library is the children's room. And it's now twice the size of what we had available before. 
The theme is stuffed animals, and especially stuffed animals from books. So we have a wonderful, huge, curious George that the children always come up and greet when they come into the children's room. They usually give him a hug goodbye when they leave. And we have Clifford the Big Red Dog, and um, uh, we have Babar, and a number of stuffed animals that represent story characters. And then we have uh, divided the room up into several areas. One is a preschool area for toddlers and young children. And um, it's a wonderful area that, where the children can even play a wonderful Legos table that we have. And then we have a, a easy reader section, which is for the children who have just started into school. And then we have a larger section for the upper grade school children. And um, the children uh, also have an area right by a big picture window, which we call Cushion Mountain, and it has all kinds of colorful cushions, and children of all ages go to that area. And you'll oftentimes see a number of children lounging around reading. It's wonderful to see this. We also have programs in the children's room. We have um, toddler story hours, and that's twice a week. And we have preschool story hours, once on Thursday morning, and again, we have a bedtime story for toddler for all ages on Thursday evening. And uh, the children come dressed in their pajamas, and it's really cute to see. Um, we also have special programs uh, occasionally. We have um, our children's librarians are wonderful puppeteers, and they have uh, puppet shows that they do. I have been with the library for over 30 years, and seeing the culmination of our dreams has been wonderful because the new library is really state-of-the-art, and it's such a wonderful place, and people tell us all the time how much they enjoy the library. It's been wonderful to see the, the use of the library as it has increased, and seeing people of all ages and all races coming in. It's, it really has been a, a culmination of a dream.